there is one small gate and his name is Jesus. That if you go through any other gate, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. You will not be saved. There is no hope for you. There is no gate except Christ. And all those who miss Christ, miss forgiveness, miss right standing with God, and enter into a devil's hell. When was the last time you heard a sermon on not only the gate, but the way? He says, there is one gate, but after that gate, there is a narrow way. If I were to look at most Baptist life today, most evangelical life, and were to reinterpret this text based on what I see in the lives of professing Christians, I would have to say this. The gate is narrow, but the way is broad that leads to life. My dear friend, a person is saved through faith in Jesus Christ. But most people today are not trusting in Christ. They're trusting in a decision they made a long time ago. They're trusting in the fact that they passed through certain evangelical hoops and said yes at every question that was asked them. Do you know you're a sinner? Yes. Do you want to go to heaven? Yes. Do you want to ask Jesus to come into your heart? Yes. Did you ask him to come into your heart? Yes. Then you're saved. That is not scriptural at all. It's not found in scripture at all. It's not found in church history at all. But it is the way we do evangelism today. And that is why the great majority of people in America and in the church believe themselves saved when in fact they are not. And they prove they are not because although they claim to have walked through that one small gate, they live in the broad way. They look like the world, they act like the world, they talk like the world, and their lifestyle will be the very thing that condemns them on the day of judgment. But today, is it not true? Who can stand up and say any different? That the great majority of people, not only outside of the church, but inside of the church, say, yes, I've passed through that small gate. Yes, I've believed in Jesus Christ. But when you look at their life, they live just like the world. They have the same desires of the world. The only thing they do is they're religious and go to church on Sunday. But when you look at their life Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, there's no Christ. And when you look about their conversation and their desires and their dreams and their passion, there is no Christ. And when asked about the confidence of their salvation, they say, I prayed that prayer. They're trusting in a prayer. I made my decision. They're trusting in a decision. I believed at that moment. They're trusting in the sincerity of their decision. Instead of doing as our forefathers did, how do you know you're saved? I am looking unto Jesus Christ and have great assurance because I can see the changes he has wrought in my life and the way he disciplines me zealously and guards my life. They've got a little bit of religion. They go to church on Sundays. They're not passionate about the Word of God. They're not passionate about knowing Christ. They're not convicted of sin. They never weep over the sin in their life. They're never concerned about genuine fellowship with other believers. But they're in church every Sunday and they're pretty moral. But they do not grow in the things of God, nor in a passion toward God. That's the most dangerous type. And our church are filled with people like that. That salvation is a supernatural work of God. It is a recreating of the heart of the very core and essence of a human being. And if that person's heart or core has been transformed, their lifestyle will be transformed. I always have, often hear people say, well, you don't, you, you don't know what's in my heart. But the Bible says, don't have to know what's in your heart. It comes out of your mouth. That's why on Judgment Day it says they will be judged for their words. Because all their words come forth out of their heart. You can't judge a book by its cover, Pastor. Jesus didn't say that. He said just the opposite. 
Jesus said you can judge a book by its cover. You will know them by their fruits. Well, I may not live like a Christian, but in my heart, I love... Do you know what the heart is? The heart in Scripture represents the very core essence of a human being. It is what a human being really is. When a man dies, that he's not there anymore. If you're ever there when someone dies, you just notice the body seems to just turn to clay, an inanimate thing. The moment that man breathes his last, the heart is a representation of the centrality of everything you are. So this is what you're telling me when you say, I may not look like a Christian, but in my heart, I love Jesus. What you're saying is Jesus Christ has changed the entire core of my being, and the entire core of my being is dedicated and in love with Jesus Christ, but it's not going to affect any other part of my life. Does that sound right to you? When Christ taught the great rabbi as he was, he sat down. He was sitting there. A lot of times Christ, I mean, Christ is amazing. The personification of the book of Proverbs. You did not want to get into an argument with this man. And he sits there and he looks at them. You will know them by their fruits. Now let me ask you a question. Grapes aren't found on thorn trees, are they? And I can just hear the people, you know, Jesus, you're a carpenter and all that. You don't know a whole lot about agriculture, but you're right on the money right there. You're not going to find grapes on thorn trees, thorn bushes. It's got thorns on it, Jesus is not going to bear grapes. Well, you're not going to find thorns on a fig tree, right? There you go, Jesus. You're on the mark. What you're saying is true. Jesus, if anybody comes to you saying they've got a fig tree and it's got thorns on it, don't listen to them. They're either lying or they're insane. Jesus said that in the same way. Anyone who comes to me saying they're a Christian and they don't look like one, they're either lying or insane. You see how Jesus would catch men? Very dangerous debater, this man. Let me give you an example. I, this is an illustration I've used a million times. Let's say I arrive here late. The pastor's all upset. Everyone's angry with me. And I walk in the door. I'm late. I'm dressed like this. My hair's as combed as it gets. And, and the pastor goes, well, Brother Washer, what's the problem? You're half an hour late. Don't you appreciate the opportunity to preach in this church? I mean, the people have been waiting here and you just show up late. And I say, oh, brother, I'm sorry, but let me explain. I was coming down the highway here and uh, had a flat tire and had to take the lug nut off the tire. And when I took it off, well, it rolled out into the middle of the highway and I just wasn't thinking. So I walked out there into the highway and I picked up the lug nut. And when I stood up, there was a, a log truck weighing 30 tons going 120 miles an hour. And it was like five feet in front of me and it ran me over. And so that's why I'm late. He's going to say, you're a liar or you're insane. And I go, no, really, why can't you accept my word? He goes, you're out of your mind or you're an immoral man. And I say, but why? Explain this to me. He goes, it's impossible to have an encounter with a logging truck and not be changed. Then why is it possible for you to have an encounter with God and remain the same? Behold the power of your God, not even the strength of a truck.